This is the Startup Pregnant Podcast, episode number 11. Hey, everybody. I have the amazing Molly Mayhar joining us today as a guest. We have tried for almost three months now to get this scheduled. And then after switching around four or five different times, lo and behold, We both had colds today, so you'll hear us in all of our vocal glory together on this episode. As Molly says, I sound like a man. We are in the thick of it together, so bear with us. There's some amazing content, even with the nasal sounds of our voices. So more importantly, a quick heads up for all the mamas and parents who might be listening over speakers or with kids around. In this episode, we're going to talk a lot about S-E-X. So if you want to put your headphones in or pause it now and listen later, this is your heads up. So here's what's coming up in this episode. I talked to Molly about her business, Stratajoy, that she's been running for nearly nine years now and her tribe of women. She, uh, of women, women, you guys, women, women. She runs a mastermind called Elevate where she takes 14 women each year and works with them the entire year with retreats and everything. And it's it's just a stellar program. Um, and she's a second year long program called Reclamation for Powerful Women that's virtual. I ask her about both of these and we get into the business details of how they work and what she's learned by by cultivating and being in these communities of women over the past several years. And then we turn to talk about a practice that she has called a word of the year. And last year, her word of the year was pleasure. So what does it mean to go from your mind and brain and your business mindset and the go, go, go and the ambition and really dial into the physical body and understand what it means to experience pleasure throughout your body, not just in your mind? And what about erotic and sexual pleasure and female orgasm and how orgasm differs across people, men, women, and beyond? She shares with us an adventure she took and how she dove into learning about everything. She gives us her top three book recommendations for those of you who might be looking to learn more about sex. And I ask as many questions as I can come up with in this hour. So what I love about this episode, too, is that while we will probably have lots of sex experts and hormone experts and other experts on the show in the future, I'm sure we will. What I think that's really fascinating about this episode in particular is we get to dive into one woman's journey and exploration and learning what they learned through their lens and their experience. And that's one of my favorite ways to learn. So I hope you love this episode. Put in headphones if you need to. And I hope that you learn things that maybe you haven't learned before. Let's get started. Welcome to the Startup Pregnant Podcast, where we talk to creative leaders about what it means to be an entrepreneur and a parent. I'm your host, Sarah K. Peck. Life can be really unpredictable, especially when you're getting ready to add a baby to your life. The sponsor of this episode, Aeroflow Breast Pumps, is dedicated to making the hassle of getting your breast pump a little bit easier. Actually, a lot easier. Head to aeroflowbreastpumps.com slash startup to have them help you qualify for a free breast pump through insurance. And stick around because at the end of this episode, I'll walk you through how it works and tell you a little bit more of how Aeroflow breast pumps can save you so much time. As always, hit subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a minute to leave us a review, we would love that. If you need any of the show notes from the show, head to startuppregnant.com. All right, let's get started. All right, everybody. I am so, so excited to have Molly Mayhar here on the podcast. Welcome, Molly. Thanks, Sarah. Happy to be here. And I, I know we were just talking about how like it's taken us a little bit of time to schedule this. We went back and forth for a couple of months. And I remember you emailed me being like, I really want to do this. We just have to find the right time. And today I woke up. I was like, no, I have a cold. I was like, there's no way I'm canceling. Not at all. <laughs> yes, as discussed, I also sound like a man over here. I have a total head cold. I'm on flu medication. You know, we're doing that. But it's exactly. life, man. I feel like we had my mom was in the hospital. And then I had a meeting with the principal that got scheduled over all, you know, that full on, full all on right. season of life 
All done. of it. If we stopped every time we had a cold, like we're moms of kids, like kids come with lots of germs and I have to treat each cold like, okay, is this the one where I really need to sleep? Or is this the one where I'm thankful that I can take Advil? Exactly. <laughs> okay. I'm glad I believe in drugs. I'm, I'm totally. Really glad. totally. <laughs> it's like, all right, let's, I've got my steamer here. Like when I ask you a question, I'll probably mute myself, steam a little, then I'll get back on. It'll be great. <laughs> so first, can you start by telling us a little bit about your entrepreneurship journey and your work journey? Like you have this amazing website. I am... I like get a feeling in my heart. I don't know how, a better way of describing it, but when I see the website, I'm like, she is just nailing it. And her website for <laughs> people who don't know is Stratajoy. But can you tell us like, where'd you come up with this idea and how did you start? Yes. I'll play you the, the quick version because I feel like there's many, many podcasts of the full version. And I know we have other juicy things to talk about. Yes. But quick version was, I was one of those overachievers, did everything I was supposed to. I'm not sure exactly why and how, but when I was in college, I decided what I was supposed to do was hotel management. Again, I wish I could go back and like redo my Cornell years. But studying hotels got, you know, went to Seattle, worked for a bunch of like the Fairmont and did some amazing event planning and got what I thought was my dream job opening a sexy boutique hotel on the sales team, which is like a coveted nine to five hotel job. Wore like cheap polyester black suits and drank a whole lot of Starbucks lattes, rode the bus in the rain. And I just had this really specific morning where I was reaching back to turn on my computer, like turn on the monitor. I was like, what the f am I doing with my life? <laughs> like, this is not what I am supposed to be doing. And I did not know what I was supposed to be doing. I just knew that that was not it. So cue complete quarter life crisis convinced my boyfriend at the time, now husband, that we should sell everything we owned and travel around the world so I could figure myself out. Did. Amazing. Spent, yeah. And we had this, you know, great backpacking travel adventure. It was kind of right at the time that location independence was becoming a thing. Like I remember reading the four hour work week and I was listening to like a Tony Robbins audiobook, but I'd never really been a personal development person before that. I had plenty of leadership training, but not in this this like, think about your life kind of way. And I remember having a thought, I'm like, where's like the young girl doing this? Why are these all like old, super masculine men telling me, you know, feel the pain, feel <laughs> the pain. I was like, where's, what's the young cool girls version of this? And that was honestly the idea that started Stratajoy. I was like, I want to talk about all of the things in our life that are beneath the surface, below the surface. Like, how do we feel about our jobs? And how do we feel about our purpose? And, you know, are we here to do something grander or greater or, or more specific and small? I was basically sick of like happy hour chats about shoes and how much we hated our bosses. Mm. So that was the impetus for Stratajoy. And I think I sold my very first three-person workshop live in Seattle in 2009 called Lifestyle Design, <laughs> a la Tim Ferriss, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> And, you know, I just was one of those people that I didn't care how many obstacles were popping up or how many side jobs I had to work to pay my bills. Like, this is what I was supposed to be doing. I felt deeply connected to both the purpose and the women. And I just played in my head what I called the long game. Like, if you don't give up, you won't fail. Now, I understand that's maybe not the wisest mantra to have, but it was mine. I kept adjusting things as my, as my life changed, as I got married, as I moved to California, as I had kids, I really let strategy become a reflection of kind of where I was, both how it was set up, like structurally and financially, and what we were talking about. So now I'm a mom of, you know, two toddlers, well, a kindergartner and a toddler now. And I'm really interested in how do we reclaim or hold on to that piece of ourselves that's the Sarah, that's the Molly when we're inundated with our roles, mama, wife, entrepreneur, even really mm -hmm. like, how do I get to just be Molly? What, what, where is the space for that in my life? So oh, I, I love it. There's a roundabout story of strategy. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. And for those of you who, the few of you who haven't found Stratajoy yet, you'll get lost inside of the website in the best way. And Molly describes herself as a internet grandma, which I love that phrase, because you've been <laughs> doing this for 10 or 11 years now. And the writing is so amazing, which leads me to my next question. And this is a question like, 
that I just think about when I think about you is I have loved watching you grow and things are changing from the outside. And tell me if this is true. Your scale is changing. Like the last time I was watching you give one of your live talks, there was like a thousand women listening in. It was amazing. So how is the world right now changing in your work in terms of scale? And how does it feel to be getting big? <laughs> this is just a total side note, but when you said big, one of my old women from my mastermind that I run, I think she took part several years ago, but she texted me yesterday that said, so here I am reading Facebook and Danielle Laporte commented on your post. <laughs> I felt famous by like, you know, association. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, well, I've actually known Danielle a long time, but yes, I understand. It still gives me a slight thrill as well. Um, but strata joy and scale. Back to the question. There's a couple of pieces of it. One was when I was pregnant and going through that whole piece of transition. I told this to Tara Gentile the other day and she just laughed and laughed at me and said, that is so Molly. Because every day on my to-do list, I would have as a goal, grow a tiny human. I'm like, dude, it takes up a lot of energy. I have to grow this human inside of me. So I'm going to, I'm going to put this on my list and I'm going to check it off. Yes. I grew my human today. I was also kind of purposely keeping things really, not small, but just intimate, really doable, very much like lifestyle business size. I wanted to have a lot of time with my kids. I wanted to be able to breastfeed as long as I wanted to breastfeed. I wanted, you know, to just have that flexibility. And then maybe in the last year, and this is probably what you're seeing and experiencing from the outside, I felt like we had a little leap in what I could claim around my business time and energy wise. It was different from the previous four years. And so I'm kind of playing with this power here and in this desire. And I'm not 100% sure that I what I want to grow into, but it was definitely a piece of this isn't necessarily like Molly's coaching practice. This is actually a thriving community. This is a company. If I want, I could claim the role of CEO. Mm -hmm. um, and I knew that to do this, and part of it was because I finally came up with the program, the teaching that I'm ready to teach for the next five years of my iteration. Like it's been born that I could get behind that. And then I knew what my weakness was, which was marketing. I'm like, all right, we're going to spend a year learning about marketing. And it's still my least favorite piece of it. <laughs> but it's the piece that allows a thousand people to be on a webinar with me. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's, you know, I'm doing, I do my Elevate Mastermind. And I've got this reclamation, this 10-month program that someone said this to me. And I was like, exactly. She goes, oh, it's like your B-School. You know, like Marie, Marie Forleo's B-School. She's like, oh, it's your B-School. I'm like, yes. This is my B school. <laughs> it's not about business making money or marketing, but no. this is the thing that I would love to teach and launch year after year after year after year for the foreseeable future. It is deserving of upping my game scale wise. Mm -hmm. You have launched so many projects that I'm just like, Ooh, sign me up. Ooh, sign me up. Um, <laughs> and one of them is your Elevate Mastermind. And another one is this reclamation program. I'm really fascinated by Elevate. Can you... Tell us about what it is and how it works. Yeah. Yeah. And let me tell you how it was born because yeah, you know, entrepreneurs or I don't ever call myself that. I don't know why I just said that. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you, you birth things. Yeah. Children. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so Max was just born. Max is my firstborn. And I had a little come to Jesus moment with Strata Joy and with my time going, well, this is kind of an expensive hobby right now. Like I was, I was making some money and I wasn't working anything else, but it wasn't sustainable yet. Here I am looking at this precious child who I love more than anything going, if I'm going to be away from you, it has got to be worthwhile. Like on all levels, financially, security wise, I need to feel like I'm making the difference I'm here to make. So I took a good hard look at it and said, I need to do, here's the thing I hate marketing and selling. So how can I reduce that, but actually get to do more of the good work, the coaching, the, the circling, the gathering of women. And so I emailed maybe 20 of my you know, strategy lifers and said, Hey, I'm thinking about putting a year long program together. And we'll like go on retreat and we'll coach together as well as like me one on one with you. And what do you think? Like, does that sound like a good idea? <laughs> and I got a bunch of positive responses. And that very first year that I launched it, I can remember sending the email. So back to these, you know, 20 women, I was like, okay, well, if I can get three of you to commit to this, 
at five grand. It's much more than that now, but that first year was five grand, which I mean, almost made me puke sending that email. That was so outside of my comfort zone. That was such a big leap to anything I'd been doing previously, but I was doing it for so many reasons. And so mm-hmm. I sent this email and I remember like, I think I had to take a shot before I sent it. Like that's how scary <laughs> it is. And I immediately, like immediately had three or four, five people email me back and pay the deposit. Like done. We're doing this. Wow. So that, that's not exactly what you asked, but that's how it was born. And it, it was born both out of a desire to serve in this way and a necessity for my own life. And I never feel bad about admitting that. Mm-hmm. And I don't feel bad about admitting that now when I'm potentially moving out of Elevate in the next few years into just this online program that doesn't require so much of my individual time. Like right. it's a new phase of life. I want to be the mom that can go to the Halloween party at my kid's school, you know, the drop of a hat. And I'm not right now. I, I work a lot more than that. So mm. I'm okay with doing that, right? I know some people aren't, but I don't mind making it work for me and letting that self-focus be a driver of how, what I'm building. Oh, I think that's so fascinating. And I think that like there's this craving for women across the board to be able to have more freedom and choice about what work and parenting looks like. And, and I've even heard from men too, that are like, wait a second, like I would like that as well. And there's just a paradigm shifter that's going to be happening. The more people do this. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we live in this small town. So I live outside of San Luis Obispo and there's not a lot of industry. There's like the university, Cal Poly, and that's about it. I mean, you know, there's hospitals and there's things that run, but there's no, I don't live in San Francisco. There's no, you know, big companies. There's one. I take it back. There's one. Mm. The point is lots of my friends are small business owners. Like they're the people who own, you know, the corner grocery store. They're the people who own the yoga studio. There are all versions of online or, or offline brick and mortar entrepreneurs here in the small town. And so it's a really different version of building our lives out of that. There are not so many partners that both go to nine to fives. This is just not how our life is built out here. And I love that. I love that. There's much more of an emphasis on just like what you said, like, how do I want to build my time and my work and my involvement in my kids and my involvement in my community? There's something about that small town that I think gives a little more flexibility or even importance towards that, that I really appreciate. This is super interesting to me because I think like, even in my own practice, in my own work, there's the default of thinking that I have to be working from nine to five every day because that's Mm -hmm. what people do. And then there's the reset of... Well, actually, life can look like whatever it needs to look like to accomplish whatever is important to you. I know so many people, when I talk to them, they're just like, wait, what do you mean? What do you do during the day? Like, how does it work? (laughs) Or or they even ask me like, but how do you do all that with a kid? And I'm like, wait, I got to tell you, I have childcare, right? Like, that's a thing too. So can you share with us a little bit of what your week looks like? Like, how have you designed your life to be the mama of these two kids and to be birthing these business projects? Yes, I can absolutely share. Although I will have to say, I thought I had it all dialed in with this new school schedule and I was just collapsing under a moment of overwhelm maybe a few weeks ago. And I said, why do I feel so much busier? Which is one of my like least favorite things to feel. Mm like overwhelmed, not busy. I don't mind being busy, but overwhelmed. I'm like, why is what is this? And whine, whine, whining. And, and I like looked at my schedule and I realized I'm running all the same programs and I'm even working on a new one that I was doing last year. And I have the same amount of nanny hours that I've always had 25 hours a week with my nanny. And our school schedule with the kids have changed where I did two pickups last year. I did two preschool pickups on a Tuesday and a Thursday. And I have 13 this year drop off and pickups. Oh, right. And I somehow because it was just like, what happened now I have two kids and two different schedules at two different schools. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I went from two to now I do max five, five, and I do three of Jula's three. So that's 13. Yeah. Yeah, No wonder I feel a little bit more overwhelmed. It's a lot of interruption to someone's day. (laughs) Totally. Totally. So the kids are in school and daycare. And so, yeah. So Max is in kindergarten from nine to two, Mm -hmm. five days a week. Juliet goes to preschool Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, just till noon, nine to noon. And then I have my awesome nanny who cares for us Monday through Thursday, like 11 to five. Mm. 
so she'll, you know, both takes care of me, like laundry and helping me keep my house at some level of cleanliness and the kids, the kids, because I'm generally working till five. That's the latest I'll go on calls. Yeah. Takes the village. We're all running in and out at different, who's got the minivan, you know, <laughs> going to the library. I can't go to yoga. You need the van because there's a singer at the library today. Okay. In general, I work from home. I am okay with naked babies running in the back of webinars or, <laughs> you know, you mean maybe even on this podcast, we'll hear a, you know, a meltdown going on out there with Carol, my nanny and Juliet. I like it. It doesn't bother me. I'm used to it at this point. I put my noise canceling headphones on and I focus in. Mm-hmm. I've learned how to do that. I've learned how to dive in and out really quickly. Again, I think there's a little bit too much of that going on with pickup right now. And I try to respect those boundaries as much as I can. I'm not perfect. If I'm in a launch phase, I'm getting up early in the morning to write. And potentially I'm writing at night after the kids go to bed. But on a general, everything is normal. I'm not really working outside of those hours. That's amazing. I loved it. The first time I heard you say, you were telling me about the work that you do. This is a couple of years ago, but I remember you saying like, nope, it all fits in those hours. I, like, I got to get my exercise in and my work in. And it was a real brain shift for me because I think before you, you're a parent, there's like so much more time freedom in mm-hmm. some ways of being like, I'm going to exercise from six to eight and then I'll have my coffee from eight to nine. And then like, I'll like get ready for work, whatever it is. And there's just so much more. I, I feel like moms are the original project managers because you just like whip it together and your scheduling gets like up elevated to new heights because you're like nope exercise yoga is going to be there this is going to be there this person picked up yeah <laughs> exactly yeah which I think speaks to the other thing which I really think is vital and so everything we're talking about this is like what I do in Elevate Mastermind because it's mm. not a business mastermind I'm not talking about people's I mean if they have a business of course we're talking about their business because it's part of their life but it's not like business training We're basically saying, like, here's our beautiful lives. How do we make them work in a way that works for us? Because Mm. for the most part, I'm working with, like, such incredibly talented, ambitious, privileged women. Like, we know it's all champagne problems. They still hurt. You know, how do we get more joy in our day? How do we have a better relationship with our partners? How How do we stand up to bosses that need to be stood up to, basically? So one of my superpowers is just, like, you get to decide. Mm. there is no right way to do life. And there's literally only your way. And here's my point. I promise I had one within all of that crazy, busy, multitasking. I'm like literally walking Max up from school with his scooter over one shoulder. I'm recording a pep talk for a client on my, you know, thing. And I'm icing my ankle on the way because I have a tendonitis in my Achilles tendon. <laughs> like what? talk about the epitome of multitasking, mm-hmm. but that has to be balanced with some level of silence, like some place in your life that is quiet and still and just for you. And I know it's hard to come by and I don't think there's a perfect answer for anybody, but I feel like one of the crashes that I see and that I experience is when we get so spun out and so consumed by living out there and we forget to turn inward that we kind of like lose that grounding. We lose that centeredness within ourselves. And I think it's really easy to do as a busy working mom. Oh, I love that so much. Like just having a moment of depth and quiet. What does that look like for you personally? Well, it shifts. My favorite version of it, I was for months, kind of in the spring into early summer, basically before we left on a really big Croatian vacation. And I hate waking up with an alarm, but I was reworking that story for myself. I was waking up at 6 a.m., putting my walking clothes on. I also am not a runner, putting my walking clothes on, putting my little backpack with a thermos full of coffee and my journal and my phone, which I wasn't allowed to do anything except for listen to podcasts or music on my phone. No checking of anything. And just walking, just like getting out the door. I live near the beach. I'd walk down to the beach. I'd take my shoes off. I'd walk in the sand. I'd drink my coffee on this little stoop and I would just journal. I love to journal, journal, even if I can't do that. I mean, that was like the ideal, most amazing hour. And I'm not 100% sure why I haven't gone back to it in any (laughs) concentrated form, but I was doing that every morning of the work week. And that's when it was working best for me. Hmm, Hmm. Question, why am I not doing that anymore? But the shorter version of it is coffee, journal, early morning before my kids get up. Just Hmm. that, that silence. Because I am beat by the end of the day. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like maybe I'll throw myself in the bathtub, but generally we'll watch an episode of The Walking Dead and go to bed. Like that's all I can handle. And totally. I don't judge myself for that. <laughs> My days are really exhausting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's okay. So, so morning. That was amazing. And and I think it's so critical. And it's something that actually Erin Boyle, she was our last guest on the show, depending on when this airs, she was a guest on the show. She talked about like, having kids is inviting chaos into your life. It just is. And having a business too, right? It's inviting lots of other people into your life. And there's stuff that goes beyond what you imagine. And she said something similar, which was, it's not about achieving the perfect life or the simple life. It's about like finding a moment or five minutes that just changes the tenor of the whole day. And you're capturing that with the stillness. I mean, like full disclosure on Monday, I was having what I call the spinnies. <laughs> Do you might know what those are? Yes, <laughs> but yeah. like I hadn't exercised in a while. I was coming down with a cold and I called my friend Emma and I was like, I have to tell you everything that's wrong with my life. Like everything, all of it. She's like, why don't you just <laughs> tell me all of them? And I was like, you know, when it's like, there's a ping pong ball in your brain and it just bounces around and it needs to get out, but it doesn't. And she's like, just keep talking. Just keep talking. Keep getting it <laughs> <You know>? out. <laughs> yep. Get it out. And it's the spinnies. They happen. And it's what you said about like having something to ground you, whether that's a bath or a water or nature and you have used the hashtag nature is my church I think is what you use yes oh yeah one of my favorites every time I see that I want to drop everything and run outside (laughs) (laughs) it is one of mine and it's funny it's one of those when I get away from it it's hard to avoid here where I live and, and I'm from Montana where I grew up but sometimes I forget how vital it is until I'm back out in it and it's almost like a deep soul release of oh this is what I was missing. Right. And that's actually the difference between me getting out and doing my journaling and coffee drinking out on the beach in front of the ocean versus on my couch. I'll take whatever I can get, but there is a different level when I am outside. Absolutely. So I love that you share part of your dynamic, your family dynamic and the people that it takes to help you run your family. And then you also this elevate, I want to ask you a couple more questions about it because it's a community of women. I think you have 16 or 18 people each year ish. 14. 14. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you have 14 women that you circle with for the whole year. And like you mentioned, it's not like thou shalt be a six figure business owner by the end of the year, (laughs) you know, sales page, legal disclaimer. By now, <laughs> it's it's like, hey, we're going to show up as our full selves and we're going to deal with the real matter of life. And you kind of glibly said it was champagne problems, but I actually, I think there's such depth to showing up as we are, who we are, and looking at the study of like, am I enjoying the moment and the day? And like, how do I work with the relationships that I have right now? Can you tell us, you have such a window into the world of women and the concerns and the feelings and the emotions. What do you think are some of the stories that we aren't telling the narratives that we need to open up more as women, as sisters? Oh, I've got lots of them, but I think one of the themes I see is that (laughs) whatever we think is wrong or crazy or unworthy or unwelcome about ourselves that we hide you're guaranteed that even within your like next level of circle, there's several other people that feel the exact same way that have the exact same thought. And they're the things that people will harbor shame around. Like post kids, will I ever enjoy having sex with my husband or my partner again? I don't know. God, does everybody feel like this? Nobody's talking about it. Like that's when I think there's right now specifically and seeing women being battered with this, this idea that it is such an amazing privilege that we really can do all the things. We can own the business. We can have the children. We can travel to Croatia and rent out our house. Like, but there's, there's, <laughs> the possibilities are endless. And yet in that, it is exhausting and overwhelming for the brain piece of us. Like, I don't know what to do with all of this. And I don't know how to do it all well. And I don't know how to make sure it looks good to everyone. And so I'm going to shut down. I'm going to not to not choose those beautiful things that are in front of me because I don't know what it means yet. Or I don't know if I'm worthy. I, you know, all these stories we tell ourselves about, am I worthy of this? Yeah. Can I do it? Is it okay to do to make these own choices? So I feel like there's an undercurrent of people just really as beautiful as their life looks like on the outside, doubting the way that it's put together. Am I the one who's supposed to be carrying all of this? Mm. Like, I am not sure I can do it or want to do it any longer. 
maybe that's the theme. And it's heavy. Yeah, really heavy. And it's torn up in those, yeah, but here I am whining about my privileged life kind of piece. Mm-hmm. So we do a lot of like, hey, this is a judgment-free zone. If you want to whine about the 200K you're making, go for it. Like your problems are your problems. Like how you feel and what you experience is true for you. It doesn't matter if I don't understand it. What matters is that's how it feels. Yeah. And so kind of this radical honesty, I mean, we mentioned this before we started recording this truth telling, Mm -hmm. how do you tell the truth about yourself to yourself? And it's basically eliminating judgment about what's coming up or as Rachel Cole once said, and then it was funny, I heard Liz Gilbert say it again on this weekend. I was just on, there has got to be some piece of you that allows yourself to tell the truth without worrying about what you're going to do with it. Just because you say it or admit it or finally write it in your journal doesn't mean you have to make a change or do anything differently yet. You can just sit with that. And I feel like that's one of the ways people avoid deep diving into their lives Because if I really say I'm questioning my satisfaction of my sex life, does that mean I have to get a divorce? Does that mean I will never reclaim anything below my neck, like back to me? Does that mean I'm, you know, blah, blah, blah? No, it doesn't mean anything. It means that's how you feel. We'll deal with what comes up. Don't worry about it. Just admit the truth. Tell the truth. And then obviously because of the way that I work in circles um, and all the group aspects, tell the truth to yourself and then tell it to your sisters. We call it witnessing. Let us witness that for you. We're not going to give you advice. We're not going to tell you you're wrong. We're just going to witness it so that the shame can't exist in that little vacuum of your brain. I don't remember what the question was, <laughs> but there's a long answer. I, I'm taking a moment with that because it is, it's giving me chills. The idea of like putting a huge spacer between the observation of something and the judgment of something. Yes. Like it's so easy for my brain to be like, you don't make enough money and you're a terrible person, right? Like <laughs> and you have to stop exactly. everything you're doing and get a job. These are the spinnies, right? You know, yeah. in launching anything. What if it doesn't work? Well, then I'll have to get a job. I should start looking for jobs. And like, before I know it, I've opened up a new tab and like, I'm on some sort of, I'm like, how did I get there so fast? And just telling the truth and starting with this project is uncertain that's where I am. Period, space, space, space. Like just stop yeah, there. You know, here's a tool. This is what I would say. If you can like self-aware yourself to that place, I'm just going to tell the truth. And this has been new for me. This wasn't something that I did naturally really, really turning into body mm. to be able to sit with that. You know, like the feel your feelings, which I love. It's one of my life skills of the your branding, the reclaimed woman, but the feel your feelings. People don't know what to do with that. Okay. So I'm feeling my feelings. Like, what do I do? Nothing. You feel them, but not only do you feel them like emotionally, I want you to practice like somatically feeling them. Where do you feel them in your body? What does it feel like? Can you sit with that feeling without it killing you? Yes. Go there. Like let the mind melt a little and see if you can. Oh, this project is uncertain. Whew. What does that feel like? Where does it feel like that? Can I breathe into that spot? And you're not solving or fixing it. You're just letting it be. Like you said, creating that pause. Right. And observing and being like, wow, I clamp up my diaphragm right there. Like I'm breathing uh-huh. out of my left lung only. Interesting. You know, like what's happening yeah. over here on the right side? Expand, <laughs> expand. Uh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Pinpricks. I always get pinpricks behind my eyes, like that precursor to tears. When wow. I really let myself sit with a lot of the things that I won't let get to sadness, I'm going to move on. I'm going to push into something else. But right. oh, I'm sad about this. Interesting. Because I can feel pinpricks and I know that body signal for myself. Interesting. Oh. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. And you don't have, and that's exactly, it's like, hmm, interesting. Right. Yeah. Right. You're, and it's like these little clues in our body. And I think it's so interesting because that self-examination of the body can take a while to study. Like people mm-hmm. always said, it's either a hell yes or it's a hell no. I never have a hell no. I don't have one in my body except for with like a few certain things. A lot of the times I have this, my head cocks, it goes to the left yep. and I go, well, <laughs> and then I try to convince myself to do something. And I had to examine it for long enough to realize that like, I can feel it when my neck shifts and my chin tilts and that high pitched voice comes on. I'm like, oh, that's my hell no. Like, that's uh, the one that's not a hell yes. And that's the one that's telling me, ah, this isn't right for me. 
And it's so wild because your own body is like your story of, and this map of clues and we get to put these patterns together. Oh my God, Molly. And now I'm getting like shaky and tingly in all the best ways. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you I've got lots to say on this, but I agree. And I feel like we don't give a lot of credit to this, right? It's definitely a feminine tool that is cast aside. You know, the whole, I mean, we, I get it. Trust your intuition and the body piece of that. But who actually would say that in a job? Like, have you ever said a boss, hey, just, well, besides in our industry, <laughs> like, like a boss in the real world, hey, right. just tune into your body. Like, what is your body telling you here? Yeah, I use that question all the f-ing time with my clients. Like, hey, just get quiet, breathe. What's coming up in your body? It's pretty powerful. So powerful. So <laughs> powerful and scary, I think, for people who are practicing it for the first time. Well, yeah, because when are we ever taught that that's an okay thing to trust? Mm. Right? Well, no, no, go make a pro and cons list. Like, right. please show me right. the end results of these, <laughs> you know, whatever it is you're doing. Whatever you're well, trying you to know do. what? Sometimes I just know. I can remember getting in fights with Ken about this, my husband, who is very like practical, logically minded in this way. And well, many things when I'm very opinionated, but I've honed it to the fact that I don't question why ask me a question. I will probably give you a real quick, confident answer. And he's like, but like, what's the logic? I'm like, I don't know. That's just how I feel. Mm. He's like, well, that, I don't get that. How don't you know? I'm like, this is how I feel. And whether it's, you know, do you like this neighborhood or that neighborhood? Or are you going to launch this or not? I'm like, yes, no, definitely not. You know, you don't spend as much time going through the gyrations of what does this mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one of the practices you've had for a number of years is picking out a word for the year. Ooh, yes. (laughs) And I know that the word of the last year, it's pleasure, right? For this year. Last year was pleasure. Last year was pleasure. What's this year's word? Evolve. Evolve. Okay. Can you tell us how did you start doing this practice? And then I want to dive into the pleasure word with you. Yeah, of course. I don't know when it started. I'm, you know, somebody in the personal development world clued me into it. But seven years ago, I developed my own little program around it called the Holiday Council. So I actually teach this. I mean, there's nothing to teach about picking a word, but we do a full three weeks about recapping your year and doing some kind of magical woo stuff about looking forward. And then I am definitely an action oriented planner. So the piece of let's take this word and these ways of being and start using them to think about what your year's going to look like. So some goal work, some just day to day, like how does your schedule reflect this kind of work? I've picked a word probably since 2010, nine, maybe. I'm not sure if I could name them all, but... The internet will tell us. The internet will tell us. (laughs) Many, many of them. And it's funny, they're cyclical. You'll see if you look at my words in a pattern, there's a year that'll be like, go big. And then there'll be a year that's like treasure. And then it will be something else really pushy and forward. And then it will be like essential. So I can see in my own energy cycle, I have a year that feels like I'm moving forward or even being a kind of masculine action oriented word. And then the next year I'm like, okay, that was enough pushing. Like, let's practice some gratitude for what I have. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And pleasure was an interesting choice because it was actually a combination. I remember getting really nervous because I always share my own worksheets with the women in the program. Like I literally take pictures of them and post them because I love seeing how the inside of people's brains work. Mm -hmm. Plus I think it normalizes that we all have the same fears and we all worry about the same shit. And, you know, that kind of thing. But pleasure for me felt really scary because it felt so soft and so selfish in a different kind of way. You're going to think about pleasure. Like that's what you're going to work on for a whole year. That's what you want to call into your life. And then I got really nervous about it because I knew for me that it wasn't going to be an easy word. It wasn't going to be an easy year. For me, that was actually a push word. It just didn't sound that way to other people. Because I was specifically talking, like I have a great joy orientation. I I value joy highly. But for me, pleasure was very much on a little bit of the sensual, like of the senses, but really on the like the sexual piece of my world and intimacy with my husband. And I think I referenced it earlier, but that idea that I knew I was living like neck up, I wasn't in my body. So all of this new body things you heard me just preaching about, those have only really been born of the last two years worth of work. I was very much neck up liver. Interesting. Let me think about this. Let me plan for this. Let me take experiments. All the things that I value about myself, 
but I had the sense that I was just, that there was more to access and I had no idea how to do it. So you picked this word pleasure. How did you start exploring it? <laughs> well, everyone will laugh. For the first six months, going to workshops and reading books about pleasure because that's how I learn. <laughs> <laughs> right? Let me, let me research pleasure. But that said, it actually was a beautiful place for me to start. I did this program with Laura Catone called, I don't even know if she's doing it anymore, but it was part of her sexual sovereignty school, the Artemis school. And this was like a very specific weekend called Initiate. I can't remember, but it was about women's sexual pleasure, basically. And I went with one of my best friends who's a doula and a yoga teacher. And I was one of the very, very few like non body practitioners. So there were like sex workers. I don't know. What are they called? Today? Sexological body workers. There were doulas. There were yoga teachers. There were nurses. There were, and I'm like, Oh, I'm, I'm like a life coach. I definitely don't put my hands on my clients. <laughs> um, <laughs> but that gives you a little bit of a feeling of what, you know, what the comfort level was here. And it was like this beautiful boarding workshop. And it was a mix of like learning about how the goddess has been cast out of our our history and then learning about like really practical anatomy pieces. I used to teach sex ed in college. It's not that I thought I had this like <laughs> missing piece of information, but as an adult, as a 36 year old, I was like, oh, I have missing pieces of information here. This is fascinating. And we totally did like the, what you imagine the women in the 70s do with the mirrors and looking at your everything, you know, in your little corner of the room. And I had like this amazing, like sex knowledge person. So I was totally the one, you know, I can't think of what things are called. Whatever, like the thing the doctor sticks in you and goes, <laughs> makes it open up. I don't know, whatever they did, keep, keep you all open. Yep. So she's like talking about it and everyone's in like their private corner, but I like raised my hand like, Laura, do I have this right? Is that what you're talking about? <laughs> like, I, I'm an expert. I am going to learn this right now. <laughs> like right there. Is that awesome? Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. <laughs> there was all levels. It was besides that part, it was a close on workshop. Everyone. So don't get too many ideas, <laughs> but it felt like this level of, well, I'm on so many levels. I also had to introduce myself by saying, hi, I'm Molly. I'm in a, heterosexual monogamous relationship and I have two children and drive a minivan and I was definitely like the odd woman out mm. that was an interesting experience for me but in general I got to have a bunch of conversations that I was not sure how to have before that weekend and then of course because I'm an oversharer I brought that back to my elevate group and we did a whole month on pleasure and we read some amazing books and of course then I brought it back to my husband and said hey here's some things that I'm learning about myself and my desire and I want this connection with you. And I don't think we ever had a bad sex life, but after kids and honestly, just getting so busy, I was like, I, I feel like we're making no progress here. I feel like this piece is a stagnant piece of our relationship. And so we worked with a coach for a while who I love, Michelle Lisenberry. I forget what her tagline is, but it's something like she's a mom. She's in a monogamous relationship, which is kind of rare for these pleasure teachers. And I wanted that. I wanted someone who understood the constraints of what I was going to be doing on my year of pleasure. I'm like, it's going to be with my husband and it's going to be in this, you know, mom version of my life. But she was really wonderful. And I, we did some work with her and she recommended some practices like owning, which is orgasmic meditation, which was hit or miss for us. But again, just the idea of paying attention to this and talking about it and making it a priority was such a game changer. There was definitely a piece of like somatic knowledge of myself and my body. There was definitely a piece of, and this was like the biggest conclusion when people asked me, well, what is kept on from your year of pleasure? I was like that my desire is intimately tied into how much I'm working. I feel overwhelmed and busy and I'm working outside of my like desired hours, basically after five or on weekends, which I don't do. I can't tune into that other part of me. There's not enough time. There's not enough silence. There's not enough space to transition from super powerful Molly entrepreneur to let me practice receiving in the bedroom, Molly. Like it doesn't happen. And that was the biggest takeaway. Like pretty much everything that I was like, Oh, what if it never gets better? was all on me. This is fascinating. <laughs> I like I'm like, I'm kind of censoring myself because I'm not sure how many details to give, but the, there is the general. And then I just started talking about it, Sarah, honestly, like with my friends, with my 
clients in reclamation. We do a whole month on pleasure. And I understand it is wildly out of some people's comfort zone, which is why I give them a choice. Like you can just stay in sensual pleasure senses. Like how do you make every moment more pleasurable by wearing the fuzzy sweater or drinking the tea that gives the best scent off? Or we can spend some time doing sexual exploration. Like I am totally comfortable going both places. So how did you do that? Did you break into two groups or? No, we just, so we did a couple of safety things. Like if people were going to say something really graphic on Facebook, we just put like a trigger warning on the top. Mm-hmm. I do a two hour Q and a every month for the topic. Cause it's topical. So reclamation, we have a very specific topic for each month. So on the pleasure month Q and a, I just said, Hey, I'll spend the first 45 minutes answering all of the sensual pleasure questions you guys have. And then for those people who are going to be triggered by talking about, women ejaculating and you know like all these other things right. I know people want to ask me about like I will give you a distinct thing. now it's time to leave goodbye all of you in sensual camp and sexual camp time for those questions we had to figure it out together of like what that looked like for everyone to feel safe mm-hmm. but, mm-hmm. Just, which is so important then also it's like I was just interviewing somebody else and we were talking about she was like I wish people just sat us down in high school and talked about the space between our belly button and our knees because no one tells you anything Like there's just this absence of a conversation, even around the like fluidity of menstrual cycles. So everything you're saying, it's so interesting. And I'm like, well, tell us all the specifics if you're comfortable with it. Like (laughs) listeners, if you're comfortable with it, like we'll just give a little disclaimer, you know, let me here. I'll give you the three best books. Yes, please. Here's the three best, best books. Come as you are by Emily Nagasaki. Nagaski, excuse me. Uh, there's, I think I added extra syllable. Come as you are. Pussy by Regina Thomas Hauser. Mama Gina. Wah, wah, wah. And The Women's Anatomy of Arousal by Sherry Winston. Absolutely my top three. Mm, I love it. Since pleasure was last year and you spent a year on it, what would you say changed in your relationship with your husband and, and in your bedroom sex life if you can share in a way that's comfortable for you? Yeah. Well, so again, mainly most of the things I was experiencing were more related to how overscheduled I was keeping myself and how much in like the masculine dominant get done energy I was being. So, I mean, it's honestly the difference, like, Hey, like we're on the board for some sexy time later. I'm going to go take a bath. I'm just going to go be silent and relax and breathe into my body. Instead of, you know, cleaning the kitchen up until the moment that we jump in bed and tear off my clothes. Mm -hmm. Like I needed to build in some like transition time kind of to be Molly, to be not mama, not entrepreneur, just like myself, the self of me that wants to go into the bedroom and take off my clothes with my husband. And I wasn't giving that any importance before. So I was feeling like a to-do, I guess, instead of, oh, this is something I want. Like I'm feeling it physically in my body. I'm feeling it emotionally in a way that I want to connect with you. I mean, honestly, that was the biggest lesson for me. As far as bedroom stuff, well, I learned some new tricks through, <laughs> through, some, through some of this. And one of them is really simple and it's breathing with your mouth open. And I don't know what the whole, like, I think the explanation was there's some energetic channel between your mouth and your sphincter. And if you open it, you can feel everything a little more, but it's one of the ones that we both remember. So when I'm getting like too tensed up or not relaxing into it, my husband will like pry my mouth open. <laughs> like, ah, ah. I'm like, oh yeah. Ah, okay. Getting in there. This is like a running joke in all of my groups now, but I was very much into this and I think it came out of the pussy book or maybe it came out of my training. I can't remember now. We just call it a pussy hug. And it's literally just like cupping your own vulva and just like, you're not doing anything. It's just the pressure. It's just bringing attention. Oh, I have lady parts. Oh, there can be blood flow. And it's like not a sexual, I mean, it can be a sexual thing, but it's not a sexual thing. You can do it to yourself in the middle of the day. And so this is running joke. We don't do it publicly. I don't think so yet, but within the Facebook groups, there's like hashtag pussy hug. <laughs> and sometimes we're all be out and be like, you guys, I think we need to drop into our bodies. Everybody pussy hug for a little while. Okay. Just do this. Just remember, ah, we're women. We have bodies. We can access wisdom here. You can have pleasure. (laughs) So they all laugh. So sometimes it's just like, oh, I'm going to, like, let's start with this. Start here. And the book Come As You Are was fascinating to me. Fascinating, fascinating, fascinating. And it made me 
it feels so understood and everybody who's read it because it's about basically just the differences in desire and I won't I won't get into it because I'm no expert but the different arousal patterns that in general females and males have and how theirs are really visual and ours aren't and so I can remember having these conversations with Ken he's like so I don't understand why it doesn't turn you on to like see me hard over here next to you I'm like I, I don't know it doesn't turn me on <laughs> Mm. it's like because if I saw you like touching yourself next to me oh my god like oh I'm like yeah doesn't do that for me (laughs) and I always thought that was wrong like there was something wrong with me and then reading this book and having these conversations like oh my god this makes so much more sense wow okay so I'm gonna get off the podcast with you and go read all of these books that you're recommending (laughs) (laughs) I feel like you need to put a trigger warning on this podcast I will (laughs) when I do the introduction I'll tell people like we're going into these like these places. <laughs> so if you don't want to listen to it, don't listen. <laughs> It'll probably be the most listened to episode. And just, again, I feel like these conversations, we have them about spirituality. I have them about money. Like, you know, when was the last time you could talk cleanly and clearly about your debt or how much money you make or how stressed out you are about somebody's secret gambling debt? I, you know, I just telling to me is about being okay in a safe space, right? A safe supported space to, to not have to carry any of that by yourself. Right. And that's so important. That distinction, you don't have to be alone and it doesn't have to be like public to the world unless you're ready for that. It can be a conversation with a close group of people. Yeah. So smart. So smart. Molly, this has been amazing. I am so glad I got to ask you all these questions about sex. I knew the ones were coming. That was quite clear from the email. I was ready. Good. I could talk to you for hours and hours and hours, but this is perfect. Thank you so much. You are so very welcome. And to everyone telling the truth and just, you know, showing up. Like it's get really real, really mm-hmm. fast. Life gets juicier and deeper and I don't know, more present. Right. Because if you can't yeah. start where, with where you are, where do you start? Yeah. Yeah. It's like diving into your own life. It's like allowing yourself to go below the depths. And mm-hmm. and again, I guess it's not for everyone, but I think that's where the interesting things are. <laughs> that's where those, those life-changing conversations will take place. That's where that, you know, the truth behind the truth, as Liz Gilbert says, like that's when it will like, you know, the lightning bolts of clarity will arrive from. So where can people find out more about you and follow you on Instagram and all those good things? Yeah, Instagram is a great place. I have a personal profile, Molly Mayhar, as well as a Stratajoy profile. There's a little overlap, but mainly if you want to see the beautiful places I live and travel and my babies, you can follow me personally. And much of my like personal musings are over there. And then probably the best thing is as I am still like a pretty classic newsletter writer, Monday Love Notes. So come to strategy.com and there's like a thousand bajillion places that you can get added to our list, but join the list. <laughs> amazing. Um, That's still where I tell the stories. It's where I tell the stories. The website mm-hmm. is amazing and you put out offerings all the time from your yes. worksheets to your holiday council to the reclamation series and your mastermind. There's just so much good stuff coming from yes. your corner of the internet definitely a thriving community so come come hang out with us I promised at the beginning of the episode to tell you a little bit more about the pumping journey and about how Aeroflow breast pumps works they are the sponsor of this episode so for all of you breastfeeding and pumping mamas here is the info that you wanted Aeroflow breast pumps makes the process of getting a breast pump covered through your insurance as easy as possible. They have dedicated and informed breast pump specialists to help you navigate insurance by taking care of the paperwork, the phone calls, and the prescription requests so that you can take it easy. They're available by phone, text, or email to answer any questions you have during this exciting time in your life. One of the trickiest things is the timing of everything. A lot of insurance plans only allow you to get a pump within 30 days of your due date. Let me tell you, figuring out when that baby is going to arrive and then getting everything done within these exact time frames can be really hard. They take care of everything, including contacting your physician for a prescription, recommending the best breast pump options for you and your lifestyle, 
billing and processing those insurance claims, and shipping the breast pump to your door free of charge. The entire process is totally free. So if you want to work with them to get your breast pump, go to aeroflowbreastpumps.com slash startup, and they will get you started right away. Thanks for being a sponsor of Working Pumping Mamas, Aeroflow Breast Pumps. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Startup Pregnant Podcast. If you have a question or a comment about the show, head to startuppregnant.com for all of the show notes, episode quotes, and more. We have weekly blog posts and a lot of bonus resources all over at startuppregnant.com. If you want to support the show, the best thing you can do right now is hit subscribe and then leave us a review. And if you'd like to become a sponsor, go to startuppregnant.com slash sponsors to find out more. Thank you so much, and I'll see you on the next episode.